in the heart of a tropical rainforest, a secret construction site. 600 acres cleared to make way for it. A familiar scene of devastation, but with one crucial difference. Here, for the first time, the destruction of the rainforest is taking place in the name of nuclear power. By the end of the century, this remote forest will be home to a massive complex of six nuclear reactors. It's the latest stage in the world's most ambitious nuclear power program. No other country still believes so strongly in the nuclear dream as India. Life in rural India remains much as it was thousands of years ago. But in the cities, the picture is one of relentless modernization. With its population set to reach the billion mark by the turn of the century, India sees economic development as the only hope of freeing its people from poverty, hunger and disease. Since independence in 1947, India has pursued a policy of industrialization and self-sufficiency. India is now a major manufacturing country, advancing into high technology. But rapid industrial growth has brought with it an energy crisis that India must somehow solve. What then is the answer to the power crisis the country is facing? It is a power source that does not pollute, a power source that's economical, a power source that's safe, a power source that will last for years to come, a power source created by the ingenuity of man, nuclear power. While most Western countries are shutting down or mothballing their reactors, India boasts the fastest growing nuclear program in the world. With plans to spend over three billion pounds by the year 2000. India's enthusiasm for nuclear power goes back over 40 years. Under the Atoms for Peace program in the 1950s, the Western nations offered their nuclear technology and expertise to the rest of the world, an offer gratefully accepted by India. Canada provided the plans for a research reactor and sent engineers to help in its construction on the outskirts of Bombay. To translate the designer's dream into reality was no easy job. Numerous structural drawings had to be made, hundreds of technical problems solved. The time is 5.36 a.m. The Trombay reactor went critical in 1960. Attention, the reactor is now critical. Attention, the reactor is now critical. We were in a euphoria. The claim was made by Dr. Homi Zebhaba, who was first founding chairman of atomic energy program in the country, and he was very close to the prime minister. He made a speech that it will be so cheap that you would not need to meter it. I hope this conference will play its part in helping the progress of mankind towards the ever-widening dawn of the atomic age. For India, the atomic age began in earnest in 1970, when its first commercial power reactor was switched on by Indira Gandhi. The Tarapur plant was an imported American reactor. But by 1983, Mrs. Gandhi was opening a reactor at Madras 
that was built without any foreign assistance at all. Today, India has eight nuclear reactors operating, backed up by atomic research centers all over the country. With deliberate self-sufficiency, India mines its own uranium and thorium, manufactures its own fuel rods, and reprocesses and stores its own nuclear waste. And it's a program that's constantly expanding, with six more reactors currently under construction, and ambitious plans for another 14 over the next 20 years. Today, nuclear power is the only alternative left to us. It's inevitable. It's economical. It's pollution. -free. Even after Chernobyl, all, questions of safety safe. receive reassuring answers. In the common man's mind, there is a constant fear of radiation. But radiation is a fact of life. Scientists tell us that milk is 200 times more radioactive than water. Still, milk is essential to proper growth. Yes, radiation exists in everyday life. From the beginning, the government's nuclear plans met little opposition. There was no debate in the country. There was no critical opinion available in the press. There was not a single article written about pros and cons of nuclear power. In the parliament, it was simply hailed as the greatest achievement. According to Atomic Energy Act 1962, anything connected or related to nuclear power and nuclear energy in this country is total secret. Even Indian parliament cannot ask questions. If it asks any question, government has under the act power to refuse that information. India's 1962 Atomic Energy Act forbids the disclosure of any information on any aspect of the country's nuclear energy program. It prohibits photography, sketching, pictures, drawings, maps. The penalty? Up to five years in jail. For 40 years, India's nuclear program has grown up behind a carefully maintained wall of secrecy. Debate is stifled, opponents harassed. Only official information is available. Even owning a Geiger counter is forbidden. And as for outside inspection by the International Atomic Energy Authority, India doesn't allow it. So our investigation into nuclear India had to be totally unofficial. We came as tourists with amateur video cameras and we smuggled in our own Geiger counter. Our investigation began at the very first stage of the nuclear cycle, uranium mining. The parched landscape of the state of Bihar, 130 miles west of Calcutta. The tribal people called Adivasis have lived here for thousands of years. But because their traditional homeland is scattered with deposits of radioactive uranium, it's now officially designated a prohibited area. No foreigners and no cameras allowed. At Jadagoda, mine shafts tunnel into the hillside. The Uranium Corporation of India employs 3,000 people. A huge milling complex has grown up, processing 1,000 tonnes of ore a day to extract the valuable uranium yellow cake that fuels India's nuclear program. The mines and mill are ringed by watchtowers and guarded by a private security force. Many of the workers live in nearby villages, and according to these workers, there is little protection against radiation hazards. Shamdas Sharan has worked at Jadagoda for 25 years. Do the workers get any protective clothing? Nothing. The company give us cotton clothes, shoes and a hat. That's all. Nothing else. When you're handling uranium, do you wear gloves or do you just use your bare hands? We just use our bare hands, no gloves. 
It's not only me. None of the workers wear gloves. This is the list of workers who've died from cancer. R.K. Singh Rakaka died from leukemia. Surrender Singh, the timekeeper, died from leukemia. Babu Ram Sahu. Died from liver cancer. R.N. Das died from throat cancer. N.P. Jha died of stomach cancer. Not only are the workers exposed to radioactivity, the waste in the form of liquid slurry known as tailings is pumped out of the mill along pipelines. The pipes contain a cocktail of highly radioactive byproducts which are dumped into tailings ponds. The waste is supposed to be covered at all times with water to prevent radioactive dust particles from blowing around and contaminating the area. But at this tailings pond, the water dried out years ago. The mines management say that the area is securely fenced off, but villagers and tribespeople happily walk across it and graze their animals on it. They haven't the slightest idea that there's any danger. But when we lent our Geiger counter to a local village leader, it showed that the whole area was radioactive at a level a hundred times higher than normal background in most parts of India. In Britain, this would be classed as a nuclear waste dump and filled in and fenced off for hundreds of years. But here in India, the contamination is now spreading. A second tailings pond beyond the first is already full of radioactive waste and just beyond it is a river. According to the villagers, the radioactive waste regularly overflows into the river. The water runs off from the tailings pond here and goes into the Gora River and then joins the Savannah Rika River. Right here, all the animals graze on the grass. People from the villages round here use the same water for drinking and for washing dishes. When they wash dishes in this water, it leaves a sort of dusty sediment on them. Not only do people bathe and wash their clothes and food in the contaminated water, we even heard that they drink from leaks in the waste pipe itself. The Uranium Corporation of India deny that there are any hazards to local people from their operations. But the people living in the villages beside the plant question their reassurances. This woman, Lucky Pata, lives just outside the Jadagoda uranium mill. Her six-month-old baby is fighting for life, and that's not uncommon in this village, according to the local um. midwife. It happens here. After six or seven months of pregnancy, the babies are still born. Something has damaged them. They have no eyes and no limbs. They are not complete. Lucky Pata herself has lost two babies before this one. My first child was stillborn after eight months of pregnancy. We don't know why it happened. Then I had another baby. He was born with some kind of lump on his back. The lump turned into a wound, and after 20 days, he died too. He died when he was 20 days old. Have you seen any other children like this in your village? 
Ah, is that the grandma? Yes. It happens in this village. I've seen other children like this, and it's happened to my children as well. This little boy was born with deformed fingers on one hand and with most of his toes missing. And another boy born with deformed legs. Other villagers complain of skin disorders. There has never been an official investigation into the health of villagers living near the uranium mines. But the government insists that no harm has been done to the people or to the environment at Jadagoda. Over a thousand miles away to the south, is the tropical state of Kerala. Here, along the palm-fringed coastline, there's another mineral that's destined for use as India's nuclear fuel. It's called thorium, and it occurs naturally in the sand on certain beaches. It's highly radioactive. The villagers live in huts made of palm leaves, right beside the beach. The floor is the sand itself. Nearly everyone lives by fishing. The catch is spread out to dry on the sand. What the villagers don't realize is that because of the thorium, they are living in the middle of one of the highest natural radiation fields in the world, so high that the alarm goes off on a Geiger counter. The radiation count here is nearly 300 times normal. In Britain, radiation levels as high as this would lead to immediate evacuation. To India's Department of Atomic Energy, the thorium-rich sands are a valuable resource. The Indian Rare Earths Company mines 4,000 tonnes of sand a year from the beaches and processes the radioactive thorium for future use as nuclear fuel. None of the workers who handle the thorium here has any safety protection whatsoever. Do the high levels of radiation have any effect on the health of the people who live here? According to the government, there's no problem whatsoever. Radiation levels in Kerala, they say, are quite safe. And did you know that residents of a beach in Kerala, with the world's richest deposits of thorium, have been exposed to levels of radiation in excess of 460 milligrams per year for generations? with absolutely no adverse effects whatsoever. That categorical statement is untrue. Since the early 70s, scientific studies have reported a high incidence of genetic abnormalities and Down syndrome among people born in Kerala's radiation zone. To the villagers, their genetically damaged and Down syndrome children are a fact of life. In this one small village, Nindakara, with a population of just 400, it took only 20 minutes to find this group of congenitally damaged children for us to meet. Titus is eight years old, mentally retarded from birth and unable to use his legs. We asked his mother whether she knew anything about radiation. Mm -hmm. 
അപകടാണെന്നൊക്കെ അപകടാണെന്ന് അറിയോ അതോ Just a few yards from Titus's house, another boy, Ignatius, was born mentally handicapped, deaf and dumb. His mother, too, knows nothing about radiation. This little girl, Jane, is 13 years old but has the mental age of a small baby. Unable to walk or do anything for herself, she needs constant attention. She cannot take the cup, cup and all. So the mother has to feed her. Yeah, yeah. At the nearby Center for Environmental Concern, researcher V.T. Padmanavan has conducted long-term studies on the villagers' health. For the past four years, we, we, we've been conducting a health survey in this region. We have selected 38,000 people living on the, uh, mono, the, the area with high background radiation and compared their situation with another 30, 32,000 population living in a normal area. We observed a higher incidence of Down syndrome and other congenital anomalies in this area mental retardation, deafness, epilepsy, blindness, musculoskeletal anomalies. Well, the government has always been denying that uh, the existence of any problem. They have not uh, done any proper studies. They don't even recognize the existence of abnormalities. You just walk into this village, you find uh, some uh, 10, 15, 20 cases of Down syndromes and all of the congenital anomalies around you. So it's not that it's invisible. You walk into any other normal village in Kerala, but just five kilometers down a coastal village, and you won't find this many number of cases there. This center will be campaigning on this issue. We will be doing further researches on this issue, and we will see to it that justice is done to these people. From the beach, the radioactive thorium is taken by boat along the backwaters to be stored at the headquarters of the Indian Rare Earths Company at Al Way, near the city of Cochin. As I see it, the city of Cochin is living with a time bomb with around 5,000 tons of radioactive thorium stored in a silo just on the banks of the river. And the silo, as we saw it, had cracks on the wall. And we are sure that uh, this silo will not be able to withstand a natural calamity. What will happen then if that happens? If that happens, the uh, radioactive thorium in this silo will ultimately reach the river which would pollute the river, the backwaters, and the Arabian Sea, which would mean that thousands of square kilometers of backwaters and sea will be unusable for millions of years. The raw materials for India's nuclear fuel are transported from the mining areas to Hyderabad, Perched above an industrial suburb south of the city is the Nuclear Fuel Corporation. It's the linchpin of India's rapidly growing nuclear power program. Here, all the fuel for India's nuclear reactors is manufactured. The walled 150-acre complex is a top security area.
For years, toxic chemicals and radioactive uranium have leaked from the site and contaminated the local groundwater. Every single well around the Nuclear Fuels Corporation site is now unusable. There are reports of cancers and deaths in the local township, but no official studies have ever been done. We found this woman in the last stages of terminal cancer. <laughs> We don't know why this has happened, only God knows. The doctors here don't even know. People living around here are getting all these diseases, all kinds of diseases. It's all around here. It's in the air and in the water. Gases are released from the factory. It's all because of what's in the air and in the water. She's in constant pain now. She can't even eat anymore because of this. Six weeks after filming, this woman died. From the nuclear fuels complex at Hyderabad, the fuel rods are sent off to India's eight reactors. The government claim their record has been successful and safe. The Department of Atomic Energy, the DAE, has successfully pursued a program of indigenous development of nuclear power technology. The design of Indian nuclear power plants provides for not one, but multiple rings of safety, making their operation almost completely fail-safe. We do not have any reactor system which is totally safe. I have worked out that more than 200 serious nature accident or leaks have taken place in Government of India's nuclear power stations. They have not admitted it. More than 3,000 workers have been exposed to high radiation. And more than 300 have been hospitalized. Now, this is the figure I have stated, and government of India has not denied it. The government have always insisted that precautions are strict. Counter, all workers are provided with film badges which indicate if they are exposed to more radiation than is prescribed by international safety regulations. But at Tarapur, India's oldest reactor, that wasn't the case when it was visited by journalist Praful Bidwai. I saw, for instance, a number of workers queuing up um, in you know, particularly um, high radiation zone um, during a shutdown. So you had these workers with, with a dosimeter, a pencil dosimeter in one hand and a spanner in the other, who would go in, uh, just absolutely you know, run into the thing, uh, in, into the room, um, turn a nut uh, a couple of turns, look at the dosimeter, uh, give a look of fright, and run out. Tarapur is also where India's growing inventory of nuclear waste is stored. This waste can be stored safely, posing no danger to life or environment. Uh, in Tarapu, there, there is a waste management facility where radiation levels are really very, very high. Your entire annual dose would be exhausted if you were to work for maybe just an hour. And you found that they didn't even bother to take elementary precautions in terms of providing protective clothing and gear and or using lead screens, um, which would reduce radiation exposures very considerably. Tarapur has now entered the record books as one of the most radioactively contaminated reactors still operating anywhere in the world. India's second nuclear power plant was built to a Canadian design here at Rawat Bata in Rajasthan. Its operating record, more than 250 shutdowns due to leaks and emergencies. One of the two reactors was inoperable for over three years. Here too, the buildings are contaminated with radioactive tritium. And tritium concentrations tend there to be very, very high. I mean, I've seen rooms which have signs saying 
300 MPCs. That means that the level of tritium inside those rooms, uh, this is part of the main reactor building, are 300 times the maximum permissible concentration, um, which, is, which is extraordinary. I mean, you can't go into those uh, areas without wearing um, very heavy protective gear. The safety of the operating personnel is most important. In the heat of the summer months of Rajasthan, when temperature is sort of 118 <laughs> degrees, you're not going to wear plastic suits and um, plastic masks. You, know, you, just, you just boil you know, inside such suits. I found the attitude of the health physicists absolutely blase about this. I mean, they were just completely um, unconcerned about the movement of personnel in, in these very high-risk areas. Today, the Rajasthan reactors deliver only 40% of their promised power output. India's next two reactors, at Kalpakam, south of Madras, were the first built without any foreign assistance. So how have they performed? We have discovered that the Kalpakam project consumes more electricity than what it gives to the state grid because it has worked only 38% since it has been commissioned. Therefore, whenever it is not operational, it consumes more electricity. And there are a number of instances where both the reactors were down. Whenever the reactor is down, you need electricity to maintain the reactor as well as the huge township which they have created for this reactor complex. Almost all reactors uh, have worked less than 50% installed capacity. And presence level of the report is that all reactors have been officially derated. Its a contribution has been very, very meager, very small amount. A new fast breeder reactor has been inaugurated at Kalpaka Madras, making India the seventh country in the world to have one. The fast breeder was intended to be India's most prestigious nuclear energy project. Once thought to be the dream energy source, this advanced reactor is supposed to breed its own fuel, producing more plutonium than it consumes. Britain, America, France and Germany have all tried to operate fast breeders without success, but that hasn't deterred India. The day it went critical, it worked for two minutes and it generated electricity to light a 200 watt bulb. That's all? But that's all. It had one major accident. Fuel rods inside the core of the reactor got intertwined. Once it got intertwined, the entire thing becomes static. There is no precedence for such accidents anywhere else in the world. And whenever we have pointed out this fast breeder technology has not worked elsewhere in the world, the stock answer of the Indian establishment is that if it does not work with the West, it doesn't mean it cannot work with the East. India now plans to spend 150 million pounds on a second, bigger, fast breeder reactor. Critics say that the money would be better spent elsewhere. Atomic energy program takes 20 to 25 percent of our research fund. So research and development areas, 25 percent goes to atomic energy, while the health research in medical areas is less than 2 percent. Higher education receives less than 2%. Non-conventional sources of energy, renewable energy sources, gets less than 1% for research. We have very high um, the capacity of hydropower, but we are using less than 15% of our water energy. Then, as you know, we have enormous amount of sunshine. We are not using it, even 1% of it. Far from developing alternative energy, India is forging ahead with its £3 billion nuclear power program. Yet so far, it contributes only 2% of the country's electricity. Why then is India so committed to nuclear power? A poor country, which is not producing the electricity, and yet is spending 20% of its research efforts, must have some ulterior motive. 
and it does not permit an open debate. It does not allow scientists to speak up. It does not allow parliament to discuss. Then it means there is a hidden agenda for nuclear power. And what do you think that agenda is? It's a madness to produce nuclear weapons, to have the plutonium. On the 138th day of the year, at 02 hours, 38 minutes, 20 seconds, Greenwich Mean Time, corresponding to 8 hours, 08 minutes, 20 seconds in the morning, Indian Standard Time, the graph went haywire. India shocked the world in 1974 when it tested an underground nuclear device in the Rajasthan desert. The material for that explosion was made secretly in its early reactors. Then and now, the Indian government have always claimed that the explosion was for peaceful purposes. committed only to the peaceful uses of atomic energy. Don't you think that it's going to raise the prestige of India amongst the developing countries? You know, I'm never bothered about prestige. Madam, what is its significance to the science development of India? Well, naturally, that is it. From that point of view, it's an important step. Thank you. Thank you. But I think, by and large, people realize that there's double speak here, that there's a policy of deliberate ambiguity that is followed, and uh, no one buys the argument that, uh, um, you know, the nuclear program is entirely peaceful. Everyone knows, I and mean, we have known since 1974, that there is a strong military dimension. Since independence, India has fought three wars against Pakistan, a self-declared nuclear weapons state. Analysts fear that the next could be history's first double-sided nuclear conflict. Earlier this year, India successfully tested its intermediate-range ballistic missile, the Agni. No other country has ever developed such missiles except to deliver nuclear weapons. Already, it's estimated India has a stockpile of material for between 40 to 60 atomic warheads. And here, at a village called Ratnahalli, near Mysore, is India's best-kept nuclear secret of all. They call it the rare materials plant. But that's just a cover for its real purpose, to supply highly enriched uranium, an essential component for advanced nuclear weapons. Whatever the motives for India's pursuit of the nuclear dream, its program is now facing growing opposition. In the arid plains of Rajasthan, 300 miles south of Delhi, a recent controversy has centered on the Rawat Bata nuclear power station, opened in 1973. From the villages near the plant, Disturbing reports of cancer and birth defects have arisen. Those reports first came to light by chance when Dr. Sangamitra Gadakar stopped at one of the villages to break her journey. I sat there for five minutes and then I saw some children playing around and they were not normal. They were not walking normally. So I called them nearby, I went and talked to them and found that there were many deformed children there. And then I saw a small guy, about uh, 11 years old, and he had this rare condition, which is uh, exostosis, multiple exostosis, and that is multiple tumors in the long bones, and which was very sort of shocking to me. And then I saw another guy who had a big tumor in the neck, and then uh, there was another person who had a parotid tumor in the cheek. And and I asked them what is the population of this small village. They said it was 500. And that was a first shock that I received. I had not seen that before. This is not rural India, typical rural India. It's usually, you know, people say that, oh, this is due to malnutrition, this is due to this, and this is due to that. And the rural conditions in India is terrible. But I have been in rural India and I have been in many, worked in many hospitals and many small places where there are no hospitals. And conditions are not like that. Cancer <laughs> Dr. Gadakar wanted to know more about the health of the villagers. But with no official medical information available, she decided to carry out her own health survey. She began by talking to workers this from the reactor. A casual laborer in the Rawat Bhatta nuclear power plant, uh, he, in one day, 
He received 2200 millirem of radiation within half an hour, more than what he should have received in one year. So then he was uh, sent home and after 15 to uh, 20 days, there was this black burns <coughs> had developed, which were very small first, then they increased. They were not actually burns, but it is a precancerous stage of the skin. One case in particular I remember very well because uh, that man, he is a uh, person whose name is Manoha Singh and he is uh, now um, suffering from a lot of things and he has worked in this plant, he has worked with the waste which is uh, in the cooling uh, ponds and he told me that uh, in half an hour he received uh, 2600 millirem of exposure and both his lungs are uh, non-specific pneumonitis lung infection he has developed spontaneous keloids all over his body he was a worker for eight years, casually working, but now for last three years he's not going because he has got this scare in his mind that uh, it is due to radiation and the doctors have said that. When you go in, you're supposed to take a dose meter. We have to go in and come out pretty quickly. If you don't have a dose meter, you can't tell how much radiation dose you've had. Without the dose meter, you can't tell. Atomic power reactors where they have high rate of leaks, they are required to do the job for which they need remote control system or robots. Now since we do not have these facilities in the country, they use cheap labor, which they call contract labor, and these people are exposed to high radiation and then they are dismissed from the job. The people who work there are poor. They work to earn a living, so they leave their dose meters outside in the lockers. They go into the reactor without the meter, so they can stay in and work for longer. The longer they work, the more they get paid. That's why they get careless. The management don't care about it. The wages for a nuclear worker like Manoa Singh, just 50 pence a day. As well as workers, Dr. Gadakar and a team of volunteers looked at the health of villagers, especially children, living around the reactor. Her findings were disturbing. We did a door-to-door -door survey of all the households in five villages, and then we compared them to uh, all the villages just uh, 50 kilometers away from the area. Our initial findings are that as far as congenital abnormalities all uh, pull together go, and they are uh, significantly higher in the study area than the control area and uh, or the tumors uh, significantly in a higher number. One of the cases in the survey, 11-year-old Badri from a village one and a half miles from the plant. He has developed multiple bone tumours all over his body. His family are too poor to afford treatment. It's been one and a half years he's been like this. He's suffering more now. It's getting worse. This baby girl was born brain damaged and blind. Her father works at the nuclear plant. Doctors have now told her parents that she is unlikely to survive. This boy from the same village has Down syndrome. 
His whole body used to shake all the time. It's not so bad now, but his eyes still flicker. We've spent all our money on treatment for him. We've sold our business to get the money. If someone needs 100 rupees now, I can't pay it. I'm tired now. I've had enough. A bone tumour of the kneecap on a girl aged 12. Only the amputation of her leg will now save her life. Her neighbour, a little boy, born with two thumbs and a missing ear. This boy was born with two sets of teeth and has no penis. And this woman, Narayan G, has an inoperable tumour on her neck. She is resigned to a painful death. We've spent all our money on treatment. What can we do? There's nothing left now. Where can we turn now? Nowhere. Of all the people, why should I get this? It's like a curse. It'll only be over when I die. I think that the health uh, effects or the price that we have been paying in the uh, form of people's health uh, as far as nuclear energy is concerned, is too serious. And uh, I personally feel that we should look back and say no to this kind of development, uh, which says that, OK, the prices you have to pay is in the people's health. This technology has taken us for a ride, and uh, it promised a lot, delivered very little. And those who are responsible must owe it to the posterity and must answer to the people of India that how did they justify in their conscience to spend our national resources to such a wasteful technological projects which has nothing to deliver, nothing to give to the people of India. It has cost this country a great deal um, in, in money, in terms of uh, human misery, uh, hardship, environmental pollution, uh, and I think a, a pattern of decision making which has nothing to do with ordinary people and their needs. Um, so it's a bad mistake, it's a dream that's gone south.